I am going to talk about the transformation that we've been going through and really changing our culture into one of continuous improvement. And so I'm going to talk about kind of how we've been going through that journey, some of the things we've learned along the way, both the good and the bad, um, and also kind of where we're at and what our current challenges are. And then I think at the end we'll have a Q&A if anybody has questions. So just a little background on Nordstrom. So if you're from around here, you probably know what Nordstrom is. Um, we have about 63,000 employees across the United States. And then also now um, we opened our first store in Canada about, we're going on about two months now. So got a presence in Canada as well. And we do about 12.5 billion in revenue. To give you an idea of kind of our current context and our challenge, um, so complex ecosystem, we have our full price offering, which is what is indicated across those top two boxes. Um, essentially, we've got our brick and mortar stores, what we call our full lines. We have 118 of those, and you know I mentioned the one in Canada, as well as um, within our full line stores, we have restaurants too. Um, we actually have 210 restaurants, which probably seems like how do you have that with 118 stores. Um, but within our um, full line stores, often we have three concepts. We'll have a grill or kind of a full concept. Sometimes we have a marketplace cafe concept, and then we'll have an e-bar. So within a full line, it's possible to have up to three restaurant concepts. Um, and then we have our full price website, Nordstrom.com, and an iPhone app and an iPad app. So those make up kind of those top two boxes. Um, along the bottom, we've got our off-price offering. So we've got about 162 racks, um, quite a few um, in the brick-and-mortar space from an off-price perspective. And then in the digital space, we have um, Holt Look we acquired in 2011. It's a flash sale uh, site and app. And then we have NordstromRack.com as well as a Rack app. The other thing I forgot to mention is we recently acquired Trunk Club, which if you're familiar with Trunk Club, they're an online right, curator. Um, and so that happened kind of earlier this year. And then they're actually opening a brick and mortar presence, well, we are, um, in New York. So. But it's essentially to say we've got all of these touch points that the customer um, interacts with us and they all need to be seamless. So as you can imagine, um, you know, we're organized in a certain way and prior to, well, prior to my most current role, um, we were structured in a way where we had executive leadership over kind of each of those boxes. Now we have, I'm in, um, a role supporting the technology teams across that entire full price offering and I have a peer in the business who now has accountability for the experience across that. So it's kind of the first time we've organized across that um, full price experience versus by channel. Um, so I'm going to talk about our journey which really kick-started in 2011. So as a company we have two Twice a year, our board has an offsite, um, June and November. So in June of 2011, the offsite was focused on um, online growth. And at the time, the board of directors and our executive team were really looking at the landscape of other brick and mortar retailers who had kind of said, digital is going nowhere. You know, we don't need to have a presence in the digital space. We can operate with brick and mortar only and we'll be fine. And most of those companies aren't in business anymore. Um, so our board and executives said, we don't want to have that happen to us. So what do we need to do differently? And just to give you a little bit of kind of history, um, up until that point, our website, we invested in it, but it was really more kind of minimal investment, couple releases throughout the year, but it really wasn't seen as um, where we were really putting a lot of our technology dollars. Um, so coming out of that offsite, it was like, we are going to increase our investment and in online growth. Um, right around the same time, um, 
we had gone through about a two and a half year project to replace our in-store clientele app. So this is, um, it's called Personal Book. And we went through a major rewrite. It was, um, it was on old technology. We moved to a services architecture, implemented master data management, and really just spent two and a half years overhauling it. Um, waterfall project. Uh, we ran it. We gathered all the requirements at the beginning, and we basically built it for our salespeople instead of building it for our customer. And when we delivered it in 2011, um, it essentially was irrelevant. So as you can imagine, you know, sitting in a technology leadership role, it was like, okay, we've got this happening, we've got this online growth strategy coming, What's gonna, what needs to change in how we deliver our solutions? So just to add on to kind of the before picture, so we were optimized for cost. So a lot of these terms are gonna be familiar to a lot of you in this room. Uh, shared services, we had an annual planning cycle, waterfall, and that was our only methodology for delivering um, software, and big batch releases. So I mentioned the website was basically twice a year, spring and fall, at our WebEx releases. Um, and then, but we had a really great success rate based on how we define success. On time, on budget, on scope. But I think if you really looked under the covers and in the example with personal book, we really didn't meet the value proposition. Yeah, we delivered on time and on budget, but kind of missed the mark. So then after the board offsite, we said, all right, we need to optimize for speed. So we said, let's do agile. And we basically said, that's our answer. We are going to adopt the agile methodology. We are going to push it into the organization. We are going to do our traditional change management processes where we say, let's get a bunch of leaders in a room. Let's come up with roles and responsibilities. Let's document a process. We used an industry um, framework, SAFE, as kind of a, a starting point. Um, and then we said, everyone will do it this way, just said, and kind of tried to push it into the org. Um, adoption kind of varied depending on uh, the team. Some teams did it because they were told to. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, all right, it's, it's a mandate, I better do it. Um, and then we had some teams who truly believed in it and said, yeah, this is gonna make it easier for me to deliver. And then there were some teams who said, I don't really know why. And um, one of our leaders at the time, um, he said, we're really good at vocabulary engineering. Um, so basically we said, we're doing agile, but we really were doing waterfall, but we were just labeling it agile. Um, and so it was kind of one of those moments where we looked in the mirror and said, we believe in agile as you know, the principles of agile, but the thing we missed was that it should really be team led. It was more, we did the, you know, leadership ship push out to the org. So at that moment, we had a couple folks that were passionate about lean and really the improvement kata and really understanding like how do we deliver value? And let's take the time to understand what are our value streams and how do we deliver and how do we really understand our speed and then move to more of a continuous flow model. So I'm gonna tell one of the stories. Um, it's our customer mobile app team. Um, they were in a situation where obviously, you know, this is a digital space and they needed to um, really move faster and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, so when I talked about this a couple weeks ago at uh, DevOps Enterprise, I. I did this team a disservice because I didn't talk about how hard it was. I really kind of jumped right to you know what they learned and how they kind of quickly transformed. But I think uh, it's really important to know that a lot of heavy lifting went into getting them to a place where they are now. So this is this is a visual just to represent how our org was structured at the time. So uh, you know we had this. Um, what we called a bio organization, so business information organization. 
And this team was essentially the conduit between our true business and our technology teams. And so business analysts or, you know, in the agile world, this is kind of where our product owners um, were. So we had leadership layers within that bio organization. And then we had kind of IT counterparts. And, and, you know, hopefully you can see it's like we had our mobile application delivery teams. We had API delivery teams. And we had kind of API mobile app production support separate team. And then we had offshore teams, and then we also had our shared service team. So there were all these handoffs and layers um, to basically deliver anything within the customer mobile app. So, you know, they're, they were a scrum team. Um, and they really, they nailed the process. They, you know, if you asked anyone in those teams at the time, they could tell you about how they were delivering. Um, but the miss was in the results. So it's probably hard to read this, but essentially these were our um, Apple reviews, our store reviews at the time. And, you know, one star, two star, two star, one star. It's like it was, it was basically um, not the presence that we wanted to have in the customer mobile space. So, you know, I, you know if I back up to the org slide, there's a reason why I circled the, the red part. But, blasted right past that. Um, so essentially one of the first changes that we made with this group was we picked one director to have accountability for all of that. So we basically said, let's pick one leader. At the time, it was one of our thought leaders in Lean, um, super passionate about continuous flow. And we said, can you go in and let's just figure out like how we can deliver faster in this space. So, so basically, he did the go and see. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's an art. Um, he basically went in and without overwhelming the team at the time with terminology and um, you know, standards and frameworks, he basically just asked a whole bunch of questions about how the team was currently delivering value. Just said, help me understand. And essentially, he was, he was working them through the documentation of a value stream without calling it that. And at the end of this, you know, this is what he put back in front of the team. And it's messy. And it was messy. And it's probably hard to see at the top, but essentially, we were delivering updates into the Apple Store every seven months. So in mobile, Seven months is an eternity. So, um, but he made it visible. At the time, no one, no one knew. I mean, we knew that it was slow. We knew that the results weren't great, but no one had really quantified why. Like, why is it taking so long? And what could we do about it? So, um, by doing this, and again, and I'll, I'll talk about this probably a lot throughout this presentation, it, it really was about the work not about the people, like, and I want to say not about the people from the standpoint of it wasn't anybody's fault. It was really just the method that we had gone about organizing. And this was a great way to make it non-emotional and really to surface, we've got challenges within this value stream. Now what are we going to do about it? So these are some of the countermeasures that, that the team, and this is the other key thing, the team, once they saw it, they were the problem solvers, not the leader. I mean, he helped remove roadblocks, but it really was more about the team saying, oh my gosh, here's what we think we could do differently. So they organized as squads, which if you're familiar with Spotify, that model, um, basically they said, how do we get all the people who need to deliver value as close together as possible and you know, basically organize them that way? We had this thing that carried over from our waterfall um, delivery called a hardening phase, which basically was what we, what we like to um, call like our stabilization period. So technically, it was supposed to be like the code's ready and we're just kind of letting it burn in a, a bit before we turn it live to our customers. But what it really had become was kind of a catch-all and we were still coding like into this hardening phase. 
And so this team said, no, we're going to move everything to the left. We should be doing quality at the beginning. We should not be coding into this hardening phase. And then they moved to continuous planning. So when we first adopted Agile, we had these really um, big ceremonies. We would do multi-day release planning events where we would pull about 100 people into a room and we would talk about what does the next release need to look like. And everybody would weigh in on what the feature should be and then at the end we did a confidence vote and then everybody ran out and it was like, yay, we know what we're going to deliver. Um, but typically we didn't really go through enough due diligence to know if that was really what we could sign up for. And then the teams would just kind of go on their way and often we would miss commitments um, or something would change within the, the cycle but no one knew so we were surprising our stakeholders. So it's like let's move to continuous planning. Let's figure out a way to always have a backlog that the team can pull from and rather than having these like big planning events. And then the other one that they did is they moved to a single backlog of work. So in the structure prior we had teams that would prioritize and sign up for features and then we had teams that were accountable for production, fixes, uh, break fix activities, like anything that you would say is a, you know, a production defect. It's like work is work. If you're writing the code, you should support the code. Let's make it one backlog and we should be prioritizing it together rather than having these silos. So with this approach, Arudu's on board. Um, we had the process. The results significantly changed. Um, you know, our app store ratings went like just significantly higher, so that was good. We also saw results in quality and throughput. Um, so red bugs go down, features go up, so it's great. The other thing that we were able to do, as I said before, you know, we were releasing, you know, maybe twice a year, and that's probably even being um, optimistic. Um, but essentially, we were able to move to monthly releases. And the key piece of this story is we can release monthly. We really can release even more frequently, but the business, it's their decision. They decide when we release. Before, we were an impediment because technically we could not release un unless we were on the, the previous cadence. So. We found the industry, you know, most people are about monthly for the customer mobile app experience, so that's where we've landed now. But I think it's important that we really took it out of being a technology decision and it's really driven from our business. Um, so this um, is another metric, two metrics that the team keeps track of. And as you can see, our lead and cycle time, we were on a really, really great trajectory for a little while and then I bet you're wondering what happened in September. Um, <laughs> so um, this is another thing that I actually didn't get a chance to talk about a couple weeks ago um, but I think it's really good to talk through because all of this is is great but they also have had some challenges and I'll explain why. Um, so let me start with telling you really quickly what happened here. So I mentioned our board does their offsites twice a year. Uh, so June of 2014. One of the strategic topics was customer mobile. <laughs> so basically the, the topic was how do we accelerate customer mobile? And really in the context of bridging the digital to the um, uh, kind of brick and mortar experience, like how do we connect that? for our customers and how do we go faster and bigger with mobile. So that's kind of to give you a little bit of a lead in to the why they ended up uh, having their setback. So one thing was um, upstream variation and what I mean by this is when we did that value stream map there are a lot of what we call suppliers that we depend on um, in order to deliver value. Um, Examples include our privacy teams, our security teams, um, our UX designers. Um, so we had, we're practicing lean in this team 
but not everybody has adopted lean across our organization. I mean, just, just to be clear, it's like we're really early even in our journey. Um, so when you're a team that's kind of adopting those mindsets, but you're dependent on teams that really haven't, haven't embraced that yet, it can be really challenging to, to um, help them understand the criticality. Um, and again, no you know, bad intent, it's just that's the way people are doing their work. Um, so there were a lot of um, resource changes and then just some um, additional kind of not well understood items upstream that led to it. The other thing was, you know, I mentioned how do we, how do we accelerate mobile? We doubled the size of the team in two months. So, crazy. Um, so you're bringing in a bunch of new people, very talented people, but you're also trying to um, bring them up to speed on how we're delivering, and that takes time. I mean, people don't just drop in and understand the process. So there was a lot of churn with um, adding folks and then helping them um, come up to speed on the improvement um, kata and how we were delivering. The other one, this is my favorite. So these slides actually came from, if any of you went to FlowCon, there were two folks from Customer Mobile who spoke at FlowCon. These are, I, I borrowed their slides. Um, so I like, you know, this is from them. And this was the other thing that they said. They got comfortable. They were the poster child. Everybody was running around the organization saying, oh my gosh, look at Customer Mobile. They're reduced their cycle time. They're delivering faster. Their quality's gone up. They're, or, their bugs have gone down, their throughput's gone up. They are just amazing. And you know, even the team themselves said they kinda, they kinda just slipped back a little bit. So what I love about that team is how reflective they are. They were like, oh my gosh, that's, that's contributing to this. We kinda got comfortable. Um, so kinda what they have um, reinstated within the team is they just, they always need to be looking at their target condition and you know, understanding you know, what's the next thing they need to be doing to make sure that they minimize those setbacks. I think this is never done, so they're always gonna be looking at what's next to improve. Um, but again, team led, they came up with what's next. The other thing I wanted to share is how they're structured now, because this is unique. They are the only team in our organization doing this. Um, so essentially, they're organized in squads that are aligned to a business outcome. So it's not I developed the iPhone app, it is I'm accountable for driving CSAT, customer satisfaction, reviews, and our CSAT score. Um, and then we have a team, it's all about in-store demand, so that they're always looking at how are they bridging the gap between the digital and the um, non-digital or the offline experience. Um, and you know, I just for example purposes wanted to show kind of who's in the squad, but it, essentially you know, we've got our engineering resources, our product owner, our UX team, our API teams, and our testers. So they're all in the squad together, which essentially means we've got all the folks accountable for delivering value are in those squads. Um, I said this earlier, this wasn't really a change for them, but it just they continue to be accountable for both the feature delivery and the production support of those experiences. And then just, you know, again, the aligning to business outcomes. So a long way to say it's about the journey, not the destination. Um, and that's, you know, basically that customer mobile story. So I'm gonna shift gears, because when you see the story, and, you, and I talk about how we had this focus on online growth, you can connect you know, customer mobile to the digital experience. Um, when we went through this exercise, though, we said, well, this way of thinking, understanding a value stream, understanding your cycle time, practicing the improvement kata, really applies to any team. It shouldn't be isolated to people that are delivering digital experiences. It really applies to anyone. So the next story I'm gonna tell is about our restaurant, which I mentioned the 210 restaurants earlier. Um, so to give a little bit of background on our restaurant, um, it's a legacy application that we acquired eight years ago, does that sound about right? I'm like looking at my 
Nordstrom people in front. Um, about eight years ago, the original intent was to run it um, uh, as software as a service. And essentially, we ended up having to bring some of that back in. And we, we also have this tendency to um, take a packaged app and then morph it to a point where it's unrecognizable. So then when you go to take upgrades, it's super expensive. And so we've done a bunch of customization to this packaged app. And so they're in this state where they don't own the code. This team doesn't own the code. A lot of it is configuration. Some of it's customization, but for the most part, it's a, it's a packaged app running on kind of legacy tech stack. So at the end of 2013, so about a year ago, um, uh, they, they were in a state where they had conducted 11 of these, um, well, they're called reconcepts, and I'll explain what that is. So we'll have something like a marketplace or a cafe, and we'll say we're going to change it into, like we'll take a cafe from a marketplace, cafe to a marketplace, which sounds like, yeah, so, and like change your signage and open, up your, open it up the next day, but it's actually pretty complicated. There's menu changes, pricing changes, sometimes the people change, and like we have to document who the chef is, and sometimes they want to move registers around, and sometimes they want to add registers, and sometimes that means they have to add a server. So there's actually a pretty complex process that goes into one of these. So they did 11 in 2013. Her business partner called me and said, we're going to do 44 in 2014. And around the same time, this team, um, self-organized really and said we have had some service impacting incidents that aren't getting bubbled up to the level that they should from a visibility perspective um, and we have impact guidelines probably like every organization in the world um, when we have incidents in production and when something becomes a high impact it's like all hands on deck everybody in leadership gets a page it's just like it's very visible well, we were having outages in our restaurant that were never categorized above a medium. They were mediums, but we couldn't take a customer's money. So it's like, well, that seems disconnected. Like, we shouldn't be treating it as a medium. So this team actually put together an argument for bubbling it to high, made the change, and now all of a sudden, guess who had the spotlight on them? Because all these medium incidents that had been kind of floating under the <laughs> radar were now on everybody's radar. And we had varying degrees of response from our leadership team. It's like some people said, change them back to mediums. <laughs> like, I want to stop getting pages. Like, let's, let's make those mediums again. Um, and then some people said, oh my gosh, what are we doing about it? Um, and then we had, you know, people were like, what can I do to help? Um, but this team basically went through problem solving and came up with countermeasures and got support to actually solve for these incidents. So it was pretty amazing to watch. So when I got the call from the business partner, it was like, well, you need to triple the size of your team, obviously. I mean, you're going to do way more reconcepts. You're, the service is tipping over on a daily basis. We got to, you got to add people. And I was like, eh, we could. I mean, our go-to move as an organization is to throw people at a problem. Like, let's see how many more people you got. Do you need more people? Let's add more people. Um, and I was like, well, or we could go through this technique called value stream mapping, and we could document what it takes to actually do a reconcept. And let's see. We might have efficiencies we could gain that actually mean that we don't need to scale the team. And it might also make the existing team's life easier, because frankly, nobody wanted to be on this team. People were like planning their exit strategy, what team can I move to? It's hard to be on this team. How do I be successful? And so it's like, they need help too. Like, we've got a morale issue on this team. So they went through value stream mapping, and this is kind of hard to see, but essentially they took 40% of the process, or 40% of the time it took to do a reconcept out of the process in one experiment. And it turned out to be what might seem simple, um, but the team at the time, they didn't know because everybody knew that it could be improved, but they really hadn't gone through the exercise of, of demonstrating what it took. Um, 
And it turned out the intake process was really painful. We were making it painful for our business partners, and in turn, it was painful for the team. Basically, we had this request form, and we asked for, I think it was like 60 data elements or something. And we were like, can't move to the next step until we have all 60. Got to get them all, 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 you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then we actually like dug in and said, we actually only need about 10 of these to get the process started. And then we can ask for the remaining as needed. Some we didn't ever need, which was kind of nice. Like, let's just get rid of those. But essentially, the team was able to streamline the process by going through a pretty simple exercise to simplify it. This bottom part is the incident trend. So, um, you know, they were, they were having sometimes like this uh, December month, they had 24 of these incidents. So that's a painful month. Um, and essentially, they went out and replaced a bunch of the hardware in the store because we found out that that was contributing to the, the bulk of the service outages and did some server upgrades. And essentially, they were able to, last month we had zero incidents, um, and they were able to basically also do some, like, um, meantime to restore service. They were able to make that faster as well. Oh, and they all stayed on the team. Nobody left. They love being on that team. People want to come to that team now. It's like, it's kind of, it's pretty amazing to watch. They're, uh, they're, they have become the new poster child, so. Um, I wanted to include a couple more stories, but I'll go through them really quick, just because those are both directly connected to what we consider to be kind of our big C customer, like our actual customer in the store experiences those value streams. We also have what we call our little c value streams, which are our internal customer value streams. So this one is our server provisioning team. So we provision hundreds of servers a year to support uh, development efforts. Um, it's, pretty, it's a pretty painful process for the folks who experience it and the folks who actually do the provisioning. So this team went through the value stream exercise and you know I bolded customer because this team came out and they're like, our customer is in the center of everything we do. Customer, customer, customer. They actually created explicitly a product owner within their infrastructure team saying this person is accountable for being connected to our customer. Um, and essentially, super hard to read, but in their first experiment, they were able to take eight days out of the process, which you do hundreds of servers a year, that's pretty significant. Um, and they're actually doing their second experiment, um, so they, they're just ongoing improving the process. Um, this example is in our enterprise service bus team. Um, so they had basically um, a manual process for getting at logs for anybody who consumes the enterprise service bus. So um, consuming system has a problem, they call this team, they do a bunch of manual log extraction to give that team visibility and it's just basically spending 40 hours a week coming up with this. So they were able to implement logging as a service and make that self-serve to their customers so they can just go and get it themselves. Um, and so a 90% plus productivity improvement by going through that exercise. Um, this one is same team. Um, they basically went through the value stream mapping exercise and said, what does it take for us to deploy a service? And this again is little c value stream because they support the bigger c value streams. But they were able to go in and reduce the amount of time it took from one and a half, one and a half hours to less than 10 minutes. And it no longer um, takes um, four people to do it, it takes one person to do it. Um, and they can now deploy weekly instead of every other week. So just some other examples of teams that have been able to go in and kind of look at this and say, this applies to us as well. Um, and the quote at the bottom, I'm gonna talk a lot, uh, no, I'm not gonna talk a lot, although I've already been talking a lot. Um, I'll try to, you know, not beat this dead horse, but it's like the, the leadership role in this. So the leader of this team said, this was great because we got this productivity improvement, obviously. I mean, you look at the data, it's a great thing to go through, but really it was about the mindset 
Like it really changed how we looked at our work. And I think that is probably the biggest thing that we continue to have a challenge with is how do you transform leaders who were successful in the context that I showed earlier where we're optimized for cost into being successful in a context where we're optimizing for speed. So, I want to leave you with this. Underlying all of this, which sounds probably really process heavy, it's about people. You know, I tell the restaurant story, but really people are our number one asset. This method of going about delivering our work really is grounded in the people. Um, I told the story about personal book and how we really built that for us and not our customer. So we really try to encourage everyone who's building anything to ask the question, you know, would the customer value that? Um, if I didn't come across, I have a passionate belief in continuous improvement. Um, I think it's a critical component of how we need to get work done and will get work done. Um, having a learning culture is extremely important. And to be persistent, I, uh, I, I did not mention this earlier, but um, we have a case study in the DevOps uh, in practice O'Reilly publication, and this is the last line in it about keep going. Like you just, you can't give up. You kind of saw it with customer mobile. You got to be persistent. And then here's my leaders have to evolve and I'll, t I'll tell you what I mean. Um, I kept this heading from the DevOps enterprise. Gene had said, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and I just, I like that because I wish I had one. Um, <laughs> you know, the first thing, you know, I wish every leader in our organization would honor reality. Um, we, we have a lot of situations, yes, yes. Um, I mean, we have processes, a lot of processes. Um, I'll, I'll use an example. There's a process we use to implement change. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have change management processes. Um, I asked someone in that organization, I said, gosh, why, you know, why are we requiring director approval to do these changes? I mean, to be frank, the people closest to the work are actually the ones who know the impact. And you're kind of putting it in the hands of people who don't really, they're not pushing the button. So it feels opposite. And the response I got back was, this is the way the process has been for three years and your team just needs to adopt it. I was like, well, wow. So I can't get past the first part. <laughs> it's a process that's been in place for three years. We need to talk about it. Like the fact that people are asking why we're doing it is something that we should talk about. Like we should be inspecting processes and if people are working around a process, we should honor that and understand why. Um, and this next one, become a student. You know, I talked about the leader of customer mobile, the go and see. I had to add the not go and tell. Because when I, when I talk to my peers and other leaders in our organization and I talk about go and see, the first thing I hear back sometimes is, that's micromanagement. You're asking me to go stand over my team as they're developing software and watch them. I said, no, nope, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you to understand the work that your team does, ask questions, create space and help them be successful. That's not micromanagement, and it's not go and tell. It's really go and see, so that you can help. Because I think a lot of the traditional methods for leading, where you kind of sit in your office and maybe send out a directive every once in a while, it's just not how we need to be leading anymore. And um, so then it kind of leads to the next one, which is become a teacher. I think the best way to demonstrate a commitment to this is to actually teach it. Um, and it's hard, um, but a lot of our, our leaders are trying really hard to adopt the mindset, demonstrate it through actions, and do more than just say they're in, like really demonstrate that they're in by connecting with the teams and teaching it. And that comes down to problem solving. Um, we are, um, our culture is one of empowerment. Um, we're very optimistic. I mean, we're, we're I mean, we're Nordstrom. We're 
we're about our customer, we're optimistic, we want to say yes, um, but often we don't really understand root cause. Um, we want to jump to a conclusion and we want to fix it. I mean, we really, you know, we want to fix it. Often that, you know, leads to, you don't really get at the root cause. So how do you encourage the problem solving and also create the space for the teams to really get to root cause? And then I talked about the improvement kata, you know, having a target condition. And then leading by example, again, as I said, most of our leaders see this data and they say they're in. They're like, sign me up. Where do you need me to go? But then they actually go to the workshop and they get trained and then go back to what they've always done. And frankly, I had a hard time going, like not slipping back because it's super easy to just go back to a traditional way of making decisions because you know it. So like, how do you continue to um, lead by example and really um, demonstrate that you're committed to it? And this last one, ask why and articulate why. Um, this, is, this is one that I'm always, um, I'm always using in practice. Like someone will say, make a bold statement. Say, huh, why? Well, I don't know. Well, shouldn't we find out? Let's find out why. Because if we're doing something and we don't really know why, we should find out why. And as a leader, I should be able to tell my team why. If my team is working on something and they ask me why, I can't tell them why, I should go find out why. So like encouraging that constant question, because it should be encouraged. If we can't create line of sight into what we're delivering, that's a breakdown. And I feel like we sometimes gloss over it. Like, well, of course everyone knows why, but often people don't. And most people, when they know why, they, they can get in, like, get in line and go. Um, but in the absence of knowing that, I just think that leaders should be creating that. So this is kind of our representation of the culture that we are this is what we are intending to create. It's an ongoing work in progress. Um, but this came out of actually, we were going to re like revamp our leadership development program. We said, well, wait a minute. Why don't we start with what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve? Like, what is the culture we want to create? So we want people to want to be part of our technology organization. So let's talk about what that looks like and let's, let's go out. One thing we also do is we don't always go out and get external perspective. And so we visited 40 companies, some where we admired their culture, some frankly that we didn't, but we also wanted to learn from that. It's like, huh, well, I wonder how it works in a place that's very different than what we're trying to create. And what came out of it was this. It's like, here is what we're going to focus on. We actually do leadership surveys now twice a year, and it's all grounded in this. Is your leader demonstrating empowerment? Is your leader creating space for you? Is your leader teaching you things? Is your leader checking in with you? It's like a bunch of things that are grounded in this Nord DNA concept. And then this is what we use for our, when we audition. So when we're bringing in talent, we use this as a grounding um, kind of checklist to make sure that we're seeing these qualities. And then we're constantly figuring out like how do we teach empathy. It's like, how do you make people, um, or how do you not make people, but how do you help people with the scaffolding required to understand it? Because some of these skills, you know, I wouldn't say they're new, but they may not have been practiced in the old context. So how do we help people learn the skills? So currently, kind of what we're challenged with is measurement. So trying to figure out, like, what is the right metric to really measure throughput for these teams? You know, I showed the customer mobile example where they're, you know, they're watching cycle time, they're watching feature throughput, but doesn't always mean that that's applicable to every delivery team, so we're trying to figure that out. Um, I mentioned the training. Um, I, I believe that a pull model is way more effective than a push model. Um, but we, we have to kind of continually and talk about that um, and how aggressive we should be with getting people the training that they need. And then, like any organization that 
is public, we have constant expense pressures. So um, when we get expense pressures, often our old ways of making decisions surface, and we have to constantly remind ourselves that there are ways to avoid expense growth that aren't just like saving money, like true money. Often, you know, you can limit expense growth by, you know, increasing productivity. So we have to constantly have that discussion, um, and it can be challenging to help people understand when they're not immersed in it, what that means versus like looking for that bottom line savings. So that's it. So I'll stop if you guys, if anybody has questions and talk about that. I don't have a question. I just oh. want to thank you for filling in so quickly oh. on such short notice. Thanks. With a very interesting talk. Yeah, thanks. Um, great talk. That was really, really interesting. Um, given that you're the VP, it's not mm -hmm. too terribly surprising. A lot of your stuff was examples of how to, how to lead, how to, how to manage down. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any challenges having to say, upwards, you know, no, we're going to do things this way, probably not so directly, but how, how did you deal with that? And do you mean like out, like with peer group or business stakeholders or with the team? Um, no, I'm, I'm thinking more like um, the folks you report to or, or perhaps, yeah. you know, peers at the same level. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. How did you do it? Yeah. So um, I think, you know, this is, this is one of those challenges with any, you know, change management effort, right? It's like, okay, how can I practice some empathy and understand where someone else is coming from? Um, I will tell you, prior to us organizing this way, where my peer now in the business, um, prior to that, I was my peer, um, extremely talented, um, store executive, knows our business like nobody, doesn't know technology. So when you try to have a technology conversation with someone who doesn't understand technology, it was really challenging. It's like, okay, how do I talk about this? Now I have a peer who understands technology, so those conversations are a little bit easier. But I think the main thing is practicing that discipline and then using data. It's pretty, probably not surprising to this group, but it's amazing the power of data. And we're not very data driven. I mean, on the website, yes, like we track data but we don't really always use it to make decisions. So like in that example, once we put the data in front of our business stakeholder around how long it was taking us to actually deliver value, it's pretty compelling. It's like, it's pretty, then you go to people and you say, here's what we need to do to make this better. And most people can't dispute it. They might not like it. Like, you know, when we had to organize in the, when we decided to organize in those squads, we had resistors people who said, I, I think we're fine as we are. And we just kept showing them. We said, but we are not as efficient and we're not delivering value to our customer as fast as we could. And then, you know, sometimes it required escalation. I mean, like anything where you got to kind of get other people to help influence that outcome. I think the main thing is that persistence and, you know, continuing to help bring people along and just give them visibility. Like we've actually been bringing our executives into our technology space and showing them like how we're doing our value stream maps and how we're doing our stand-ups and showing them how the team is connecting to the business outcomes. It's been powerful. Before we were kind of a black box. It's like, oh, you ask IT for something, you may or may not get it. You might get what you ask for, you might get something different, but it was very, just nobody really knew. We're being a lot more transparent with that, and that helps, I think. So. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I'm kind of a troublemaker in my organization, so I'll you know, expand that now okay. since it's being recorded. Um, you, you said at one point that you asked the, uh, one of your members to go and see mm -hmm. uh, with working with their team. Um, is there such a gap between 
this, this individual and their team that they have to be told, hey, go look and see what your team is doing and how they work. Um, yes. is, and have you closed that gap? And if so, could you particularly, could you perhaps articulate that and I can, you know, give it to my management? Yeah. So, yes, there was a gap. And, and I think, so there were two things that I heard when I would encourage the go and see. I would hear, you know, the, well, that's micromanagement, which I, you know, counter with, you know, it's not go and tell. The other thing, which I don't know if this is common, but if you talk about lean principles, everyone says, well, that works in manufacturing. That works when you can stand and look at a shop floor and you can see things moving and you're Toyota. I, it doesn't work in a digital. Like, if you're doing, you know, software development, it doesn't work. So I, among, with, a, with a bunch of other people who believe in this, we were like, how do we close that gap? Like, how do we help people see that this can be done outside of manufacturing? So we actually, we did two things. Um, we joined the Ohio State University uh, Center of Excellence, um, and they bring together a bunch of different industries who are practicing this in non-manufacturing contexts, so like Target's a member nationwide is one of them. Everything they deliver is digital. So we actually did a site visit. We actually flew out to Ohio, went to Nationwide with a bunch of leaders, and we said, look at these folks. They're doing it at scale. They have 8,000 technology employees. Everyone practices lean. So finding those examples and, and showing them has helped um, to kind of bridge that gap. Like, hey, this can be done. So. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. Mm -hmm. um, another way that companies compete is they compete for hiring the best employees. And I'm wondering if um, adopting these practices has made Nordstrom's a, a cooler place to work. I mean, my opinion is yes. <laughs> um, it, it definitely, I, you know, I feel like people come in and it, it is unique, our culture I, I think is a unique value proposition. Um, we have a challenge, I mean, in this area, I mean, there is a ton of competition for talent. A lot of people don't even know that Nordstrom has the technology footprint that we have. So one thing that we've been trying to do is talk about it more. Um, but then also, yeah, people come in and they are passionate about learning how to do work this way. It's not easy. Some, some people don't see the value yet. Um, so we're trying to figure out, like, how do we help people see it? But yeah, I mean, I, th I think it has been a good um, talent acquisition play, especially when we walk people around our building and we show them how the teams are doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, you made an interesting comment a little while ago about the difficulty in getting your business people to understand the technology side mm -hmm. of things. There's sort of a flip side to that in getting your technology people to understand the business concepts and mm -hmm. understanding uh, why you're doing things in the business. You know, what, what are the motivations of doing things? How do you get your technology people to uh, understand that there's a benefit to that and that, you know, that if they understand it, they're going to improve their own lives within the business. Yeah, so that's a good question. We um, we had a pretty severe disconnect between kind of our business teams and our technology teams, and we aligned on outcomes to make sure that most of the technology outcomes are now business outcomes. Um, it still requires us creating that line of sight. Like we. And what's interesting is most of our teams want it. They're like, help me, help me see how this feature I'm delivering is actually going to drive you know, demand on the website, or how do I know that this is actually gonna drive trips into the store? So we've been adopting, and I didn't talk about it, but um, strategic deployment and Hoshin Conry to essentially do that cascading business um, strategy all the way into the teams. And that customer mobile example where they're organized by business outcome, that's the first time we've done that. 
but we're trying, the teams that are on the outside looking in are saying, when can I move to that model? Like, I want to organize by business outcome. So we're starting to um, expand that a little bit, but you're right, it's gotta be that two-way street. You can't, you can't just have business people learn the technology side. We actually had a track from our November board meeting. We did our technology revolution strategy, and one of the tracks was business technology alignment because we recognized that we had that gap. So we've been kind of trying to bring that together. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if in the course of your restructurings that um, if you took a look at um, something like incentive-driven management or um, a implementation of Intel's OKRs. What was the last thing? OKRs, objective and key results. Oh, yeah, yep. So that's a little bit of the strategic deployment where we said, um, I mean, we normally, um, like our annual planning cycle I talked about, where we basically, at the start of our fiscal year, we say, here are all the areas that where we're going to invest in technology. And then we would carve up the money, and then each area would then write a business case, take it to our executive team, and they would say, oh, that seems great. And if you actually added up all the benefits across those business cases, I mean, we'd be making like $50 billion a year. So there was no mechanism to really connect, like did the work actually drive that benefit? So this um, strategic deployment model is really about taking business metrics that are really measurable and connecting them directly to the work we're doing and then checking them on a frequency where we can actually pivot if we need to. If we're not driving trips into the store, why not? Maybe we need to do a different project to do that. Or maybe we picked the wrong outcome, but it's making it visible and we're actually, um, at the very beginning of the year, we tried this with a subset of our organization and we had 12 metrics that we were gonna drive. Um, and then we did a reset just a little bit ago and we went in and we actually did like the connection. We said, of these 12 metrics, what work is the team doing that's actually driving that? And we ended up sticking with one of the 12. So one of the 12 was actually connected. And then we added two that weren't on the list because no one had actually done the, act the cascading all the way down to the team level. Um, so I think, you know, as we continue to iterate through that, we'll, we'll get better at it, but it's good to see that momentum moving in that direction. Uh I apologize if this is an elementary kind of question, but as a uh, technician, I, I'm not familiar with a word that you used a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, concept, concepting, reconcept. Yeah. Could you explain that, please? Yeah, Thank yeah. You. So for um, within our restaurant division, um, we have different concepts. And in the case of, we have like a cafe, like in our, in our store, you know, a block away, we've got a cafe. Our restaurant team will say, we're gonna rebrand that into something called Marketplace. Or um, we have grills, which are kind of the, you know, the main offering. Um, we will change that into a, like, it's called Brazil. But it's basically like a Brazilian kind of steakhouse experience. And so you're essentially taking the not only just the physical representation of the restaurant, but also the, the back end kind of pricing and configuration and completely rebranding it. And we call that a reconcept. Does that help? So like uh, changing a taco joint to a burger joint. Sure, yes. Yeah. Yes, Thanks. you got it. That was better. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you for the great hi. talk. Um, from a leadership position, you talked about you know changing the paradigm from let's say agile or waterfall to agile. Mm -hmm. And I work in a very large company where we have the same problems. Um, beyond the mandate of hey, we're just going to do this, um, how can you incentivize those types of people who are let's say in that old guard and are just like no, or I'll do it because you said so, but I don't want to and the motivation factor of making them do it because of you know, intrinsic motivation or yeah yeah or the scare tactics <laughs> fear 
No. Um, so the one thing that I believe in, and um, and we're not there yet across our organization, is that we should enlist our teams in understanding like what is the best way to deliver value. Like often we have people who just assume that there's a consistent process that we should just deploy across the organization and we should just push it into the organization versus really understanding it's not a one size fits all. Um, even you know in this uh, value stream um, exercise, so I didn't talk about this, but our store delivery team um, was practicing Agile. And um, one team went through the value stream mapping exercise and they, they actually couldn't get through it for the first round because it was so complicated. We had, I think, 80 people in the room and we have this huge conference room and like the value stream was starting to like wrap around the edge of the room and we were like, time out, we're never gonna get anywhere. So we ended up like scoping it way down and we basically did from intake to code complete. And the team could not get any progress on it because they had so many dependencies on other teams that they, it essentially stalled out. So then we actually hired um, a leader who had practiced lean in a technology context, which I call him a unicorn because he's hard to find. Those people are hard to find. But like, understands these mindsets and has actually practiced it in a technology organization. And he came in and he said, well, I don't understand why our store teams are all delivering value differently. Like, why, why do we have five different teams going through a different value stream process? And I said, I, I don't know, it's a good question. Um, and so he pulled together a smaller group and said, let's try to understand how we can be consistent and really come up with something that makes sense for our team. So I think it's that balance of not, the same process isn't gonna work for everybody. So how do you engage the teams in a way that they're contributing to it and understanding the process? Um, and then also, you know, I talked about the optimize for cost versus optimize for speed. We used to um, make bold statements like, um, we've got to make an enterprise decision. Nope, can't, you cannot go do that because that is not for the enterprise. You're making a silo decision. It's like, okay, we don't want to get in a spot where we paint ourselves into a corner or we can't take advantage of something that's an enterprise offering, but we needed to swing the pendulum a little bit in the direction of there are teams who need autonomy in order to deliver value and capture speed to market. And there are teams that should all align on an enterprise process, but let's be more intentional about those decisions instead of kind of doing the paintbrush, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Are we good? All right, thank you everyone. Thanks for hanging out too.